thank you so much for coming out this evening. It is cold outside, but hot in here. And it's gonna get warmer as we talk about the creative economy and creative placemaking. I'm Ken Real, CEO of the Cape Ann Chamber of Commerce, and we're really pleased to have all of you here this evening. This is part of our CAKE Forum. So CAKE is our Cape Ann Innovators Collaborative. And so this is CAKE number four. We actually had um, three forums last year. It was on kind of the maritime um, topics. It was on coastal resilience and blue economy and biotech, including um, what's going on with GMGI. We're switching gears. Um, so this is our first forum of 2019. And now we're gonna start to talk about the arts. Because when we talk about innovation and entrepreneurship, the arts and our culture are absolutely key in um, that topic area. So welcome to our Cake Forum number four. Um, I want to thank a few people. First of all, I'd like to thank the Beauport Hospitality Group and Cruiseport. They give us this room at um, no charge, and um, so we're very appreciative of that. Thank you, Beauport. I would like to thank a very exciting um, new business that is officially opening up next Friday, and that is Wheelhouse Cowork. Nate Cahill, are you in the audience? Yeah. Nate, thank you very much. Nate is. Nate is sponsoring our food this evening. Thank you, Nate. We can't wait to see you open over there. That's gonna be a great, great business. I also wanna thank our cake baking team. So a lot of work goes into this event. Uh, we plan for this event for at least four months. And so our cake bakers this evening include Karen Ristabin, who is going to be our keynote speaker, Carrie McKenna, Christine Armstrong, Nate Cahill are all part of our cake team. Who did I miss? Excellent. And we have several others. So thank you so much for all the work that you do in making tonight, um, let nights like tonight happen. We are so happy to have you, our entrepreneurs and innovators of all types, come together, socialize, get to know each other in a new way, and talk about Gloucester and Cape Ann, what's happening here. And the topic of interest tonight is on the creative economy and creative placemaking. And Karen's gonna take that over in just a minute. Um, I want to hit um, a couple of programmatic announcements that um, we always have new things coming up. Next Friday, we actually have an economic outlook breakfast, and that's going to be on health care. Features the CEO of Addison Gilbert and Beverly Hospitals, Phil Cormier. He's an excellent, um, very knowledgeable gentleman, and we, we'll be at the Elks next Friday for breakfast there. And what would it, a Cape Ann Chamber event be without talking about the Cape Ann license plate? Um, designed by a uh, graphics designer out of Rockport, Annalee Babson. This license plate has put $24,000 back into the Cape Ann community through grants to our nonprofits, many of whom are here this evening, <laughs> and our schools. We love the design. We love to show our pride of Cape Ann every day, and the proceeds, $40 every other year, goes back to our region. So if you don't have a plate, talk to us. We'll sign you up. Sign you up. <laughs> sign you up. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm going to talk loud. Uh, we love to sign you up. We actually have a sign up sheet over there. Uh, last logistics note. So if this is a free event, and we'd love to have all of you out. It would be helpful to us. There are um, some people in the room that did not register tonight. It's hard to do um, planning for an event like this if you don't register. So in the future, please come out and join our events. And if you could register, that would help us plan for this evening. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce Karen Ristabin. So, Hi. Karen. <laughs> Karen leads um, a very important uh, piece of work at, at the Essex County Community Foundation, which we'll talk about this evening, and, and manages a Bar Foundation grant. And uh, we'll talk about what's going on around the world, <coughs> this whole notion of creative, creative place making, what's going on here nationally and more locally, in Essex County, and we'll also, of course, introduce our panels. So thanks again for coming this evening, and um, enjoy. So it appears that we don't have a microphone, so we're going to all have to project. Can everybody in the back hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. Great. All right. Well, yeah. Don't make it, don't make it like, loud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so hi, 
thank you all for coming to this forum. It's great to see the room full of friends and artists and towns people and city officials and business people. Um, uh, Cape Ann Savings Bank and, and all of our friends from, from uh, Gloucester. So thank you for being here. Um, so a couple of uh, rhetorical questions before we start. Do we all want our artists and creative entrepreneurs to be able to stay on Cape Ann and affordably live and work? Yes. yes. Do we all want our arts and culture organizations to be deeply connected to and supported by the community? Yes. yes. Do we want Cape Ann to be a place where residents and businesses lay down roots because of a strong arts and culture ecosystem? Yes. yes. That's kind of what this thing is all about. Uh, so you're going to be hearing tonight from uh, Aaron Clausen, who's the director, uh, planning director for the city of Beverly. You'll be hearing from Aaron Williams, who's been in charge of arts and culture in Worcester in a couple of different roles for many years now. And you'll be hearing from Al Wilson, who is the director of Beyond Walls in Lynn. Um, and uh, hear about all those projects down there. So why are we here? We are here because this is a brand new initiative, brand new as of actually a couple of years ago. When the Barr Foundation, which is a family foundation in Boston, Greater Boston, has been funding arts and culture, climate change, and education in the Greater Boston area for many years. And a couple of years ago, they decided they wanted to, they did doing so well, they wanted to spread <coughs> their wealth, which is substantial, across the Commonwealth and partner with some of the community foundations. Uh, there are something like 16 community foundations across the state. We are one of them. Essex County Community Foundation is one of them. They chose five of those 16 to provide funding for so that we can invest deeply in arts and culture in our catchment areas uh, for each of the foundations. Community foundations don't normally do arts and culture things, and certainly Essex County Community Foundation hasn't. Uh, ECCF, as it's called for short, um, has, uh, manages a lot of donor funds. So they have a lot of family foundations who park their money there and ask for advice on how to invest that money in the um, nonprofit sector of Essex County. So ECCF takes care of all of the nonprofits of Essex County in that way. And many of you go to the annual Institute for Trustees at Hingry School uh, for capacity building for all of us who are trustees or or working in the nonprofit sector in any way. However, ECCF has never done anything specifically for arts and culture until they were approached by the Bar Foundation two years ago, and the Bar Foundation said to them, how would you like to have $500,000 to invest in your area in arts and culture specifically? And they said, sure, of course we do. <laughs> so, but we don't know anything about arts and culture. So they put together an advisory committee from people from all over the county uh, including myself, and this is what it became, the Creative County Initiative. It was formally launched last spring at uh, an Arts and Culture Summit in Beverly, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that as we get going. Um, but what I want to do is just show you um, the Bar Foundation and ECCF, the basic idea behind this is to strengthen the arts and culture ecosystem. So what does that mean for all of us who are artists, arts organization leaders, you know, what does it mean directly? It's not that we're going to be giving each one of you a check or each one of your organizations a check. We can't, we, that's not what this is about. It's about building up the business, uh, the infrastructure of, of our communities so that the arts that make our communities more vibrant, safe, and healthy can benefit a little bit more from the communities themselves. So the communities can themselves, more sectors of the communities can be more invested in the arts and culture sector itself because of the value that arts brings to communities. So it's both to raise the visibility of artists and cultural organizations and at the same time, importantly, to create more equitable, inclusive, and econo economically strong communities. The, uh, the basic core tenet, the basic core belief for both the Bar Foundation and ECCF is that culture is not a special interest, but is a matter of public interest. And that is the core tenet of Mass Creative, which is our state advocacy arm, and Mass Cultural Council as well. Uh, trying to you know, change the way we think about art as not a special thing that's out there somewhere for people who can only access it in those ways but it's a matter of public interest and should be more integrated in everything we do. 
So arts, and culture, and creativity are revealed, as we all know, and expressed in so many different ways. We are, as part of this initiative, we are about supporting all, all art forms, so visual arts, performing arts, you know, music, theater, dance, whatever, and then create the, the newly forming creative industries as they're coming up, media industries. Um, but we're also thinking about culture very broadly. So culture includes the arts. The culture is all about the way we live. It's, it's how we live in our communities. It's how we get around. It is how we, uh, you know, how we live day to day and experience our, um, our communities uh, in, in many, many different ways. So as you're hearing from our panelists and from me today, think about culture uh, broadly in that sense. <coughs> and arts as being part of it. Arts is the expressive part of it. Arts can make us understand things about our ways of life, like stigmas, like traumas, like depression, like immigration issues, like veterans issues, way better than we could without the arts to translate those issues. But the culture, so the cultural part of has to do with all of those interests, uh, but also through the arts, we can understand those interests much, much better. So here in Cape Verde, as we all know, we have probably thousands of artists, arts organizations, writers, poets, musicians, many of you are here, uh, the arts and culture history that we all know and love, the cultural districts, uh, four of them are Cape Verde, cultural councils, festivals, arts associations, and art colonies. So as, as we're talking today too, think about, you're going to be hearing from other communities, and it's not to, in any way, say, denigrate what we, we have here because we value, we know who we are, we know how much what, what we are all about in the, art, in the arts and culture sector um, mean to our communities here. You're going to be hearing examples from some other communities as inspiration, okay? And so just to get some ideas going about what we could possibly advocate for and become ambassadors for here uh, on KBAN. So, um, think about culture broadly. What makes people want to live in a place, put down roots, it's the, it's the sometimes some the very intangible things. What's different in this initiative um, is the way that we're thinking about um, bringing in stronger, a stronger ecosystem for the arts and culture um, organizations and artists so that artists can stay here, so that artists can thrive here so that we can think about more affordable, creative spaces. Um, how do we think about live work ordinances? How do we bring in the systems that are working in other places and, and incorporate them into our way of life here in Cape Ann? So this initiative, with being at the Community Foundation and the way that the Community Foundation leaders and staff think about everything they do to serve the nonprofit sector, we're going to be bringing in that kind of systems thinking. Where are the systems and structures that work? And how can we sort of give up things that haven't worked in the past and bring in new ways of thinking about how we do business and how we support this art and, 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 and cultural um, base that we have here? Um, so that's, that's what's different about it. We are involving deeply the business, philanthropic, and municipal community in this whole in this whole system, in this whole way of thinking. So um, we, as artists and arts organizations, are used to talking to each other all the time. We know what we mean when we know, you know, when we say that we need more support here or there and that there are limited resources. What we have sort of fallen down on over time is proving our case to the other sectors, to the municipalities, to the business sector, and to the philanthropic sector. So the core part of this Creative County Initiative is to find ways to engage the other parts of our world, those other sectors more, so that uh, the arts sector can be uh, strong, more strongly supported. And it's done by that sort of systems thinking, and also by something called collective impact, which is what Essex County Community Foundation does. Uh, there's a, you create a common goal, a common purpose, and no matter where you're coming from, you create a language so that you can create some strategies and a, you know, to get to meet some common objectives uh, and, and have a collective impact in the work that's done over a period of time. I remind you, this work is incremental. Nothing's going to happen overnight. But we do have a two-year period to sort of prove our case. This is a two-year pilot project. It started this past January, or last month, and um, 
That's not done up. This one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, no. I'm sorry. A year ago, this, we're into our second year now. So through 2019, so it was a two-year period, uh, which ends at the end of this year, uh, there's a very good chance that the Bar Foundation will stay in for another period of time to make sure that our, the ideas that we generate in this two years get uh, implemented, have a chance to be implemented. So just a few um, ways that we, as society, value uh, arts and culture, one is the economic impact of it on our uh, local communities. Uh, the arts, unlike most uh, industries, leverage significant amounts of indirect spending by their audiences. So um, the, the income for local restaurants, parking lots, <coughs> hotels, and retail, uh, those of you in the tourism sector know this very well. Uh, based on this study, 212,000 audience surveys conducted the typical arts attendee spent $31.47 per person per event beyond the cost of admission. And that's for hotels and, and uh, food and everything else. Nationally, the total event-related spending in 2016 was an estimated $102 billion. Um, Mass Cultural Council uses the figure uh, of one in seven. So if for every dollar that uh, you uh, invest in public um, investment, uh, in the arts and culture, you get $7 back. So it's, that's, that's the kind of economic impact that is now very well known uh, in our communities. And then you talk about the creative workforce. So this is uh, from the Americans for the Arts uh, from 2017, showing, and it's, I'm sorry, it's very small, but I'll just tell you, 16,000 plus arts-related businesses employ 95,000 people across the Commonwealth. And you can see uh, the, the, uh, ask the mapping that they've done for that. Uh, that's a lot of um, that's a lot of uh, uh, workforce, and it makes up 4.3 percent of all businesses um, in in the Commonwealth, and that's the creative sector. So it's art schools, museums, all of the of what you would consider to be part of the creative economy uh, and beyond. So the numbers are there, the economic numbers are there. Um, this is another way of looking at the value of arts uh, and culture broadly in our communities. It's a pretty simplistic uh, diagram. We all want safe, healthy, vibrant, connected communities. Arts and culture, we know, contribute to safe, healthy, vibrant, connected communities. So if we create the conditions for arts and culture to be valued, sustained, and accessible by more people, we will have safe, healthy, uh, vibrant connected communities. It's simplistic, but I think it gets the point across that this is the quality of life that, uh, that arts and culture brings to us all. Before we started our program, uh, Creative County Initiative Program, we did a needs analysis. We had a bunch of focus groups across the county, which is 34 cities and towns, the whole Merrimack Valley, and all the way down to Saugus. We did focus groups and some surveys uh, just to determine the need in the arts, um, arts sector. And what we found was uh, artists and arts organizations uh, would do better if they had more cross-promotion, better marketing uh, outlets, uh, a broader audience. These are not, not any surprise there, so more visibility. If they could be more connected with each other across the county and more connected with the municipalities and other sectors that they serve, that was expressed. Uh, if there was more art in public spaces so that it wasn't so much seen as something that is not about me, it's something that I can't access, it's something I don't understand. So it would be broad, you know, something, art and, and, and place making out in a broader community, uh, culture, uh, connections for, for everybody, and not, uh, not so uh, limited. And then resources, if, if resources could be pooled, expanded source of funding, obviously everyone wants more funding, um, and how could we think better about creative spaces, rehearsal spaces, live workspaces, that kind of thing. So those were the basic needs. Um, but um, what we have, though, is, you know, we do, this, is, this shows, um, I'm going to go international now, so because we just you know, talked about our, our local region. Internationally, uh, the best uh, examples, I think, of where this kind of work is happening and happening well is actually in Europe. Uh, this, this diagram shows just the world, there's a World Cities Culture Forum that exists, and they get together once a year and talk about the value of culture across the world and in their separate communities to their local communities. That's the basic tenet of, of the work that they do, and you can see the cities represented here. 
Um, just a couple of examples, like uh, in the UK, there's a UK city of culture that's recognized every year and celebrated. You know, the, we don't do those kind of things in the US. Maybe we should start to think about doing things like this. You know, where's the, where's the state? It's the best state of culture for, for you know, 2019. And then this one, there's a, a, the London boroughs so in, in the London area, uh, London borough of culture. So places are celebrated for what they do and what they do is more deeply invest in the uh, arts and the culture of their, of their areas to do so. This is, a, um, this is an organization, it's a network of cities, European cities, uh, that in response to the needs shared by uh, European cultural institutions, um, it was formed to maximize the economic, social, and cultural contribution that the arts can make by better supporting artists, managers, the industry, and the general public by allowing them to create, exhibit, and enjoy works of art, as well as to access training through seminars, artist residencies, workshops, and research programs. So this is a network of European cities that just does this, and then they do it because of the, of the known need for it. They did a study called the Study on the Contribution of Artistic Creation to Local Development, um, basically saying that culture in general and the arts in particular are always recognized for their intrinsic value. However, in the last few decades, a new approach has emerged that increasingly recognizes their contribution to social and economic development. And then by mainstreaming culture in their local development and innovation policies, these, these countries and, and these organizations and, and cities have successfully achieved a variety of social and economic objectives, among which are social cohesion, active citizenship and participation, engagement of communities, city branding, reuse of industrial cultural heritage, and urban regeneration. Uh, I think all, all of our cities where we live can, can use some, some form of that, and that's been achieved, and it's documented. So just, this is just a way to show you internationally that there is a, a, a culture of culture that's happening out there that, that uh, you know, somehow, has, you know, in some ways is filtering down and, and, and happening here in the U.S., but uh, not quite so much. They also pointed out that UNESCO and OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, both very um, seriously recognize in all of their reports the role of culture in local socioeconomic development. So that's just a little recap of how, how we value, how some people value culture uh, in, in terms of economic, uh, economic uh, development. Mark Davey, for those of you who are at the, um, at the uh, Arts and Culture Summit in April at the Cabot Theater, he was our keynote speaker then. Uh, at that event. He uh, has Future City out of the UK, and this is just a smattering of, of, of projects that he's done, cultural placemaking, uh, creative placemaking projects that he's done all over the world. Uh, so he and his team go in and figure out where the connections are between developers, municipalities, arts organizations, artists, designers, and make things happen in the area of creative placemaking. This is a basic, there's a lot of words here, don't mind the words. This is, this is basically a couple of different definitions of cultural placemaking, or creative placemaking. Uh, one from the NEA and one from Artscape. Um, basically, it's, it's, it's um, so the creative placemaking in Artscape, intentionally leveraging the power of the arts, culture, and creativity to serve a community's interest while driving a broader agenda for change, growth, and transformation in a way that also builds character and quality of place. So it's about taking a place or a space and, and bringing arts and culture into it, bringing design into it, and making that a better, broader place for more community uh, input and access. The success of placemaking is dependent on collaborations between civic stakeholders of governments, private investment, nonprofits, and citizen groups. So that's just a, a broad brush. Um, I'm going to show you a little video uh, of um, the, um, one of Mark Davies' projects. This is London, funny images.
So the city that's known for its bridges, you know, make the bridges really visible, celebrate them. Mm -hmm. And his whole thing is, whatever your community is about, whatever the culture of your community is, take it and celebrate it. Mm -hmm. Oh, big time in it. Come in, you know, be creative, bring in arts and, and creativity into it and make it happen. So it's a, it's a great example of that. So, um, so a couple of his basic, Mark Davey and, and basic, uh, uh, ideas around creative place making is connectivity. You'll hear more about this from our panelists. Um, and that has to do with transportation, how we get around, how we are connected to each other, how you know downtowns are connected to waterfronts, that kind of thing. Uh, activating our green spaces and incorporating them more, more uh, deliberately into our town planning. A lot of this is done in town planning, but when you bring in artists and designers and creatives into the mix, it's a, it's a different equation. Uh, Public-private partnerships, um, doing temporary programming, you know, pop-ups, interactive projects, anything that you can do to involve the public more so that the public is a partner in whatever the project is, and then they become part of the art. Uh, using uh, frontage, using vacant commercial, cultural, and state spaces as pop-up studios, gallery spaces, production spaces. So there's a lot of space in a place like Cape Ann. We don't know, we don't think we have any space, but we really do. So we haven't thought about it really creatively, uh, maybe enough. So this is one of my um, favorite local, this is up in Lawrence. Um, the transportation building up there, this was a placemaking, it was a public art and placemaking project. It was a very large transportation building, parking garage, basically. It was ugly, ugly, ugly. And they, um, between the, the city and a couple of local nonprofits and a group of artists, created uh, a mural on the whole side of the building. This is just a piece of it, of Bubble Girl. So she's there, she's blowing bubbles, and the bubbles go all across the whole entire building. And now it's this beautiful, most beautiful expression of Lawrence's you know, spirit. So it's, it's, uh, it's that kind of thing. So this is about, this is our Creative County Initiative. It's a short video, it's just a couple of minutes long. Um, and, uh, <coughs>
it's, it's going to a place that you thought of a certain way. And because you've made a change, there's a public art display or businesses and artists have gotten together and come up with a, a creative idea to draw people into the location. It makes you think, I need to go there because that's new and different and it's not the way I thought about it. I think that public art has the ability to uh, transform thinking and to get people to feel more connected to each other, to impact the community. The diversity of these cities is very powerful. I think we can combine and infuse art into that. Uh, you end up having a fantastic experience. Thanks to 1623 Studios. <laughs>
And here's a few examples of them. We're doing a project at the Lawrence Library, uh, murals and, and lighting to, um, to uh, celebrate the library as the cultural hub of Lawrence. And there's a great group. Again, these are municipal arts and business people have come together and are working together to make sure these projects happen. Uh, we're doing a um, murals project at the Cabot Theater to make it even more of a, of a destination. Um, public parklets in the city of Lynn. Um, Al is involved with that project. And uh, pop-up places where people can gather, things can happen, things can be sold, things can be made, things can be talked about, and they can be in different places in a downtown area like Lynn. Uh, artist shanties in Newburyport based on the Hyannis model where they built some artist shanties and now they're populated with artists who are, you know, have them there during the summer months to be able to sell or their work or, or do a performance or do a reading or whatever they're doing, play music. Um, clamming skiff and baskets in Essex, the Essex Shipbuilding Museum is uh, recreating uh, an original clamming skiff. Uh, there's one that's falling apart in Harold Burnham's barn. So they're making another one with the Northeast Consortium at-risk high school students, uh, putting them to work and creating a new clamming skiff in the old way with the old tools. And they're also making clamming baskets that fit and it's a very cool project. You'll hear more about all of these during this year. Um, Let's see, we're illuminating the clock tower in Lawrence um, in, from the inside, and that's become a whole, a whole thing that, oh my god, I, I don't even have time to tell you about. Um, immigrant Voices in Salem, similar to the project that Stephanie Benanson did at City Hall here. She's doing the same thing as an outdoor installation in Salem in the spring. In Ipswich, there's a group of young, um, the young people who know how to fabricate and design skate parks. And so they're creating an artscape, a rideable artscape at town donated land in Ipswich. So we're funding that. In Merrimack, West Newbury and Groveland, they're having an uh, artist resident come in from Providence for a month next summer to do a tape art residency over all of the three towns. So they're making these, it's, it's crazy. These towns don't, haven't done public art before, so this group wanted to introduce public art to them. So they're making these large scale figures, silhouette figures, hundreds of them, and they're gonna be putting them on the Pentucket School Building, which is what those three towns uh, share as a school system. And it's to celebrate the bicentennial of a couple of the towns and people, you and I could go and trick it out with you know, some of the accessories or whatever from 100 years ago or from now, and then take one of these tape figures off, bring it home, or bring it somewhere else in the three-town community, put it up somewhere, and uh, there'll be hundreds of these figures up around that tri-town area for the next 10 days, so you can't help but interact with this, with this art and be part of it, so it's a really cool project. And then this crossing water, the underneath of the Beverly Salem Bridge is gonna be activated in a week long festival next September uh, with performances and lighting and, and all kinds of art uh, displays. So those are some of them, not all of them, but this is the kind of projects that we're, we're, we're investing in. And then Essex County Creates is here. As I said, this is what the website look like, looks like. And uh, you know, get on there. If you're an artist, make sure that you are registered as an artist. If you're an arts organization, you can post your things, or a venue, you can post your things. And we can, eventually, over time, it's gonna be you know, a much more you know, robust blog kind of uh, place for much more sharing. And, but now it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful calendar that's uh, you know, completely up and running, and, and we love it. So. Um, these are the cultural planning labs, just briefly on this. Uh, cultural planning happens in a lot of places. These are some, um, we, we carved up, we, we carved up the, the county into four different subregions. And so each of those subregions, all of the towns in those subregions can go to one of these workshops, half day workshops. We've had two, we have two more scheduled between now and March. And just to, to, to get on board with what other areas of our, of our county, of our country are doing, uh, many, many other um, regional and, and uh, municipal-based cultural plans have been done, including one in Worcester, including you know, a piece of one in, in Beverly. And so these are just a few examples of, of those things, just to show you the volume of them. And, and yes, it's time that we get on board. This process, the cultural planning piece of it, is going to lead into an Essex County-wide cultural planning process with the two planning agencies that will be done hopefully by the end of the year with some specific action items that we can do as a region that the cities and towns can't do on their own. 
So finding a way to template a live work ordinance is one idea, you know, and be able to share it among our 34 communities. Maybe we have one cultural affairs person for a subregion or several towns uh, because each town can't afford to have that kind of, you know, pivot person to deal with arts uh, issues. So those are the kind of things we're talking about uh, for that planning process. Um, this was the first one that we did at Montserrat, um, and uh, some of the tools that they can do, that, that, that municipalities can do without writing a check, are things like zoning and, uh, and, policy and um, making policy, creating a public art policy, uh, for one. Um, zoning to incentivize arts and culture uses of spaces. It's being done in, uh, it's being done in Beverly, but Beverly has a live work ordinance. I think it's the only place in our county that does. Um, tax credits or incentives for arts districts or uh, other uh, arts uh, cultural uh, development of, um, of, of buildings or land. Uh, integrating artists and innovators into community and economic development. So there are artists in, residences, in residency doing uh, work in DPWs or in public health agencies all over the country. We could model that and have, you know, have the, 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 the creative sector be more involved with um, planning and design of, of programs and, and our physical spaces. And then the creative place making piece of it as well. So um, the road ahead for us, uh, basically, uh, over time, we're going to continue with the communications and the leadership. Um, we'll continue with new innovative grants and scale or replicate the successful models that we're seeing in this two-year period. And we'll deepen the cross-sector work over time. We'll continue with the cultural planning and, uh, and then strengthen cultural organization capacities. So one of the things that we're going to be doing over this coming year is, is, is trying to provide more direct uh, support for the arts and cultural organizations of the region. Um, so you have on your table some 10 things that you can do to support the creative economy. Hire an artist is the first one, or a musician, or a designer, or, you know, or, or, okay. <laughs> uh, consider the value of arts, culture, and creativity in your life. You have these on your table. I'm not going to read through them all, but just some examples of how you can um, uh, be more involved, more deeply involved uh, in this. So I'm going to turn it over to Aaron Williams. Thank you for listening to this. And Aaron, you are up. All right. Thanks, Karen. That was a very thorough overview of the creative community development initiatives happening not only in Essex County, in the United States, across the world. Uh, I learned a lot even from your presentation, so thank you very much. I am really excited to see so many people out here tonight. You must be intrepid souls to come out into the cold to talk about arts, or as we say in Worcester, arts, culture, and creativity. And uh, we are in the heart of the Commonwealth in Worcester, and we have been really exploring the themes of what makes our city tick. I've been the cultural director for the city of Worcester for over 15 years, starting next week. And I began my career as an artist uh, in the theater community, Theater for Social Change in Philadelphia and in California, Western Mass, uh, founding various theater companies and performing arts groups, and uh, worked for the Mass Cultural Council, working with 90 communities to start to think about how arts could be embedded in their everyday lives through the local cultural council program. In 2004, Worcester wooed me uh, to come and to work with them in what is somewhat of a unique partnership. In fact, it's the only one of its kind in the country. In, two, in 1999, there were cultural organizations in our rusty gateway city that were all knocking on our city manager's door with their own personal agendas for their organizations. At that time, our economy was really not thriving like many gateway cities. We saw an exodus of larger corporations and we saw uh, a real exodus of young creatives and talent within the city proper itself. But 
we had many institutions and creative organizations that had we're not going to go anywhere during a recession. Places like the Worcester Art Museum, Worcester Center for Crafts, the oldest craft center in the nation. Uh, we have the American Antiquarian Society, Mechanics Hall. These fundamental institutional components, they were the groups that got together and also invited a group of artists to come up with a common agenda and reapproach the city to work together. The city had never thought about something like this. They thought arts are nice, we have a local cultural council, we give out some money, but they're not really necessary for the vibrancy of our city life. This agenda, though, they saw was something that was not only going to impact one organization, it was going to impact thousands of people, over 180,000 people, in fact, if they had this common agenda to work on together and to pool their resources. So in 2002, the city agreed that if the coalition members, they had formed a body of 12 organizations, would create a position, they would fund that position after three years. The cultural partners came back and said, Thank you very much, but we don't want a separate cultural organization. We want to be housed in your development office. We see arts as not just nice, but we see it as necessary. It's really necessary for the vibrancy and the vitality of our community. And we'll put our money where our mouth is, and we will work with you on an annual basis to create this cultural co coalition that will really follow these various premises, creating art, really supporting creative initiatives that would inspire people throughout the community. We went larger than the cultural institutions. We began to look at local artists within our community to think, who is it that we want to nurture and support above and beyond our larger cultural institutions? We created an action agenda, and every three years since 2002, our cultural orga organizations, now 75 organizations strong, from our museums down to the Refugee Artists of Worcester, to Slam Poets, to the Worcester County Poetry Association, we all work together with a common mission, and that is to raise the vi visibility of arts and every, in everyday life so that everyone can be engaged. Collective impact was something that Karen mentioned earlier. Collective impact is our mantra. Cultural equity is the work that we're trying to accomplish so that young people, like you're seeing here, could begin their own careers as muralists that then grew into something that was called powwow and now a Make Art Everywhere campaign throughout the city of Worcester. A little more about this coalition. We see that art needs to be embedded in everything. So I'm not, I, I, two years ago, I wasn't the biggest, uh, DPW didn't have me on their hot list for people they wanted to be around. Uh, part of the reason for that is our city manager drank the Kool-Aid. Yes, what do we have to lose? If we're gonna have a creative city, where is it that you wanna go and visit? Close your eyes and think about the cities that really create a buzz for you. Is it the city that has lots of skyscrapers? Is it the city that has a lot of malls and wide streets with a lot of traffic? Not necessarily. It's more of that serendipity. It's that unique neighborhood. It's being able to gather in different spaces within your city. It's being able to get around your city and learn the stories of the neighborhoods that you're in. How do we go about doing some of those pieces collectively? Well, we took our main street. We had started with a public art campaign where we gathered all the artists in Central Mass in a town hall meeting and said, what's missing here? And they said, our streets are ugly. <laughs> Worcester needs a facelift. So 
we developed a campaign with three prongs. We're gonna bring in international murals from, muralists from around the world. We're gonna put up 10 murals with them. We're gonna train local and regional artists who didn't have that skill set for a lot of those large murals like you saw there. We then drilled down and said, you're gonna work with some of those young people like you saw in that picture and teach them how to make murals. That was back in 2013. 2014, we put up another additional eight murals, training muralists. Some of those regional muralists now became the teachers themselves. Young people were creating pop-ups, doing internal murals on the common. And then Pow Wow Worcester spun off. Pow Wow Worcester is an initiated project totally made by volunteers. They got a buzz in Honolulu and in Hawaii where Pow Wow emerged. It's this international convocation of artists. Um, many of those artists have been in Lynn and up here in Essex County as well. And Pow Wow Worcester has now created over 95 murals in the city of Worcester in the past three years. And they're not only on our big downtown Main Street buildings. Each year they've taken a different focus. Last year they took the schools that were the most underserved, ugly, ugly schools, some with languages, more than 95 languages being spoken in those schools, and they brought the powwow artists in right before, sc before school started this past year and the year before, and they <coughs> covered three schools with murals totally. Embedding art in the community is really what we're about. And back to that wayfinding, covering the schools. DPW did not like us because the city manager said, stop, we have a Main Street initiative, we're gonna tear up our sidewalks anyway. I want to embed art in the whole Main Street. So there are poems that are going into the sidewalk. There are lighting installations that are happening. There are storytelling components around every corner. There are installations that are happening in public spaces, private spaces, our library. Within a year, I promise you, if you come down to Worcester, you will not recognize Main Street. And it will be telling so many different stories. How do we get the investment for this? Well, like Essex County, we're very fortunate to have the Bar Foundation funding some of our initiatives. They initiated, most re initiated uh, a project with us with our Worcester pop-up. It's an oxymoron. It's a permanent pop-up space. <laughs> it's located in a repurposed Telegram and Gazette newspaper building. All of the pop-up space restructuring and retrofitting is utilizing pieces of the building before Telegram and Gazette exited. It's made out of parts of the printing press. The chandeliers are made out of sewer lids from the city's transfer station. Local artists and creatives, so welders are in this mixture. It's not big C, big A art. They have all been involved in that process. When we opened that pop-up a year ago, which is a space that anyone can use for free, as long as it's a free event, it supports cultural equity. DPW's transfer crews showed up in some of their trucks and they came to the party to celebrate that space. They have been using that space. They use that space because some of them are painters and now they're exhibiting within the space itself. Some of them are poets, and they're a part of the poetry slam. So again, it's thinking about how to use art in a unique way that resonates with the community. Karen mentioned we're involved in a cultural plan. We do an action agenda every three years where all our member organizations come together and say, what are we gonna focus on right now? Well. We are doing that action plan as a citywide cultural plan, and the mayor and the city manager have decided this cultural plan is a part of the city's new master plan. They have not done a master plan in 35 years, but don't tell anybody else. 
they are going to embed arts and creativity as a fundamental component in the school's new plan and the city's master plan. Artists and creatives, new immigrants are all at the table helping to craft this. Needless to say, this involves thousands of people having to get involved. There are cat fights that do take place in some of those meetings. Part of my job is to help to herd the cats and to let people's voices be heard. But the most important thing is to be authentic and to allow for arts and creativity to bubble up wherever it can, to partner with our business and development community so that arts truly work, not only for the artist, but the art institution or the community on where it's embedded, and for your city as a whole. Great cities deserve great art. So I really applaud Essex County taking this on collectively, having more than 34, was it? Cities and towns working together is no easy feat. Congratulations on coming together. And uh, Worcester will bring up its entourage to visit some of your great work coming out of this uh, exploration over the next two years. And we'd like to formally invite you down on an expedition to witness some of the Bar Foundation grants through our community foundation in two years. So thank you, and thank you for your commitment. <laughs> Aaron Claussen from the City of Beverly. Thank you. Um, since this is the uh, Cape Ann Chamber of Commerce, I don't feel like I have to go into too deep about what is Beverly. Well, it's a good thing we fixed the mic, I guess. Uh, I'm not clearly a classically trained actor. Um, so I'm not going to go into who is and what is Beverly too much, but a, a quick story. When I first started uh, as the planning director at the city of Beverly about five years ago, I ended up at a, one of these economic development summits with the state, and I was introducing myself to the innovations are for the, for the state and, and, and let her know that I was the new planning director for the city of Beverly. And her kind of comment to me was, oh, Beverly, that's a, that's a quaint, quiet little coastal community you have there. Uh, you know, you should be really happy to be there. And I, I realized at that moment just how much work I had ahead of me. Um, Beverly is not a quiet, sleepy coastal community. Um, it's got some great coastal neighborhoods, but it's got a little bit more than that. Um, so I'm not going to go too deep, but I have to throw some stats at you since I do head the economic development department as well. Uh, the city is about 40,000 people. Uh, it's been pretty stable, but we are growing. Uh, one important piece uh, to that fact, though, is uh, we have grown about 18% our, our job growth uh, over the last 15 years, over 3,500 new jobs in the city of Beverly, and really in the innovation sector, uh, eds and meds, we got educational, uh, medical, life science sector, we, we are, um, we believe, the center of a, a life science cluster. Over 60 companies in the city uh, work in the life science uh, air arena um, with about 100, I think 120 in, in the North Shore more generally. So we really see ourselves as a center of innovation um, on the North Shore. Um, we have a lot of great assets and amenities um, that help attract some of these businesses. So we're right on 128, we've got four exits, we've got five commuter rail stations, one of the busiest uh, Be uh, Beverly uh, Depot in the entire MBTA commuter rail system. Uh, we see ourselves as a crossroads to the North Shore and Cape Band, um, figurat figuratively and literally, since the, the commuter rail station actually splits at Beverly Depot and goes to Rockport and then to Newburyport. So uh, we really see, see ourselves as an important uh, location from that respect. Um, and the, the last thing I would say is that, you know, among these uh, pieces of infrastructure, the 128, the, the commuter rail, the coastline, um, you know, uh, a, a regional airport uh, that's it's bringing more corporate travel to our city. Um, arts and culture, we believe, is a part of that uh, matrix in economic development. Um, and is part of that infrastructure that helps grow our economy. And we really, we build that into our community development strategy. <clears throat> so enough about economic development. Um, arts and culture in Beverly. We are blessed to have a lot of uh, arts and cultural entities. Uh, the Cabot has been mentioned a couple times. Uh, they, they were closed when I first started. 
uh, in the city of Beverly, opened up uh, as a nonprofit shortly thereafter. The Larcom, uh, another vaudeville era theater of uh, 550 seats, opened up at, shortly thereafter. Um, Montserrat College, College of Art, Endicott College has an art and uh, performing arts school. And so there's a lot of amenities, historic Beverly, I should say. You know, they're not just a historic society, it's a big part of the culture. They also do programming and arts programming um, that kind of all fills in a lot, of the, a lot of the larger institutional work that's going on. Um, we're also a place uh, where artists live and, and work. And there's, a, there's you know, well over 100 artists that live in Beverly and are active, um, you know, whether it's making art, uh, visual art, performance art, performing art, or musicians. And so we really pride ourselves, not just a place where arts and culture happens, it's where it's produced and, and where art, artists are living. So how do we embed this into our, our community development strategy? Uh, we, we do view it, obviously, as I just said, as, as an important economic development driver. And we, we do think that it is, it is critical to continue to grow innovation and creativity in the city. Um, um, but we also think that it's important um, as far as uh, quality of life, that uh, arts and culture are enriching uh, to, the, to the community and to the individuals who live there and work there. So we see it both as an economic development endeavor, but also just a, uh, a, a, an amenity. It's, it's a, a way to enrich our community. So what are, what, some of the things we've been doing, so planning for success, success cultural as a, as a destination. Um, we have these organizations that I've, I've mentioned, among others, um, that are really uh, bringing people and bringing notoriety to the city of Beverly, bringing them to our downtown. Um, and then how we can uh, support that through public investment, uh, placemaking, um, and hopefully we'll get more into the creative uh, placemaking uh, realm in the near future. Uh, public art um, targeted incentives to kind of grow some of the, the creative, uh, uh, creative uh, institutions, but also retail, restaurants, how to, how to really create an active downtown in particular. And then I'll talk about some of the policy and regulations we've put forward that Karen referenced to try to kind of facilitate that um, from the bottom up as well as, as the top down. So there's been a lot of planning that's been happening in the city that Master Plan in 2002 talks a little bit about um, investing in our downtown so it becomes a, a place, a, a destination. And it doesn't really mention arts and culture, but you can read around the edges and see that that's, that's kind of meant in that. And then over the years, we've advanced many plans and documents that really, as, as we've moved along, really start specifically talking about public art and culture and, and embedding that into um, everyday practices within the city. Um, more, most recently in 2013, we passed, we passed the, the cultural district plan. We then were designated for as a cultural district in 2015, um, right in our downtown. And then in about three, four months ago, we just updated that plan. Since we pretty much achieved everything we set out to do uh, with that first one, now we need to kind of take that next step and be uh, uh, more proactive, particularly in the public art space. Um, this is our cultural district. Uh, we did, as, as I mentioned, um, the Beverly Arts District was uh, adopted as a cultural, a mass cultural district in 2015. Um, this is right along Cabot Street, right in our downtown, and it, what you're seeing there are a lot of the, the, the cultural and arts assets, Montserrat College, the Cab, the Larcom, um, you know, um, Main Street, so it was a very active economic development um, and an arts uh, advocate in our city. Um, and created the Beverly Arts District, BAD. We really embraced that title. Um, it's, it's good to be BAD, as, as uh, the folks at Main Streets like to, to remind us. Um, so, so there's the planning piece. There's a lot of planning that, that has gone to really elevate arts and culture as, a, as an important part of our economic development strategy, as far as land use, transportation, um, and then in, in the future, tourism. We really want to become a destination. The next piece is investment and how we're investing in um, infrastructure in our town, in our city, to, in, uh, to encourage investment. Um, so 1A uh, was a recon major reconstruction <coughs> project along our downtown that really transformed Rantoul Street. It was a really unsafe place to be, um, both 
the buildings. The street itself was unwalkable. Um, and uh, we just completed a, this, this project, which is a $20 million project with the state and federal funding that, as you can see, incorporates bicycle lanes, um, you know, these stamped crosswalks, uh, bump outs, we call them, um, ex curb extensions at the intersections. Um, you know, street lighting that's architecturally pleasing. Um, to make it more walkable, what kind of place you want to be. Um, we have not incorporated art into this process yet, and we, we look to do that in the future. But this was a first step in really kind of revitalizing one half of our downtown, the other half being Cabot Street. So the next step was making that connection. So over here on this side is Rantoul Street. Broadway connects Cabot, which is our other, you know, other downtown commercial corridor. And it was important for us to make that visual connection um, and make Broadway read as, as a pathway to get from Rantoul Street to Cabot Street um, and really from the train station, this is the uh, Beverly Depot here, to really help lead you to Cabot um, or from Rantoul to Cabot and back and forth. Um, so the before picture is on the left, obviously, uh, hopefully, obviously. Uh, and then on the right is the after. You can see a much nicer <coughs> sidewalk. We incorporated similar lighting to uh, Rantoul Street, a little bit shorter, a little bit more pedestrian oriented, and a bunch of uh, landscape bump outs. And there's a ton of trees. I think we put a tree every 20 feet or something like that. So eventually, as, as, it, as it fills in, it's really going to have a great walkable feel. And there's opportunity, although there isn't art there yet, um, there is an opportunity with these, with these, these bump outs, these grass bump outs, and they're sometimes 20 to 30 feet long. Some people were frustrated with this taking away parking spaces, but I think over time, um, they, they've really grown to enjoy what it's brought to the street and making it a pleasant place to be. But my, my point with, uh, in, in pointing that out is that there's an opportunity for temporary art uh, pieces to be placed there or permanent art pieces. So there's, in, in our uh, work in implementing capital improvements um, in downtown, we want to make, if, if we're not putting art in it now, we want to make the space so that there's opportunity in the future. And the last one I want to point out is, is Cabot Street. Uh, right now, Cabot Street, if you've been there lately, is not the most walkable street. Uh, you don't necessarily feel safe. Um, so we're, we're working through a design process to restart a, a phased reconstruction of Cabot, um, similarly to Rantoul, but I think even at a, at a more pedestrian scale. Um, we'll, we're working closely with the Beverly Main Streets. Uh, they have a design committee um, to help us kind of determine what are, the, what are the treatments, what are the kind of street lighting, street trees, um, what's the uh, pavement uh, treatment to really make it a unique space. Um, and again, uh, how can we incorporate art into that? Uh, if not in the near term, in, in the long term, is there the space for that? So this first phase takes you from, from Winter Street to, to uh, City Hall, essentially. And we, we'll hope to, to continue that over the next couple years to, to complete that street. So it's, a very, it's what we would consider a great street in city planning terms. So placemaking uh, in 2017, so we worked very closely again with Main Streets. They, they developed a design to uh, rethink how Ellis Square, um, in, on, right on Cabot Street, is, this is Ellis Square right here. I'll, whoops, I'll point it out. Uh, it's right there. It was a pretty tired uh, public space. It was very tired public space um, that was, when it was originally designed and installed, really wasn't thought as, as a place to um, bring people out to congregate and think about uh, performances, live, uh, live performances. Um, so it was really underutilized. Um, Main Street's working with UBLA, which is a local ar architect, landscape architecture firm, came up with this plan to kind of expand the space a little bit, but really organize it so that it could be used for public art, where the, you know, pr particularly performance uh, art, and create a place where there would be a permanent art piece. Um, this is really known as Vietnam uh, Veterans Memorial at Ellis Square because across the street from this plaza was, it was where um, the draft office was for the Vietnam War. And a lot of young men who went to go to that office would end up in this plaza and sit on uh, and wait for the, tra the bus to take them uh, to war. Uh, so it was really important to the Vietnam veterans um, that we acknowledge that in, in the re re rehabilitation of the plaza. Um, and you really see it at this next piece. Um, this, is a, this is a statue that was just installed um, this, past, uh, this past fall. And this is an artwork that was commissioned in partnership with the city, Mozart College of Art, um, and the veterans group. Um, 
to memorialize the fact and, and tell that story in a really provocative way and, and really using art um, to tell that story. Uh, what's, really, what's really great is, is one, you know, you can see the, the young man sitting here, um, presumably with some bad news. Um, uh, and the, there's eight of these markers that give you the, the larger story of the, of the 11 men who uh, went to Vietnam War and, and from Beverly and, and died. Um, working with Montserrat College of Art, uh, we're really kind of also activating it in that, that uh, there's going to be a video and documentary um, for each one of those uh, uh, individuals who went, went to war. And someone who goes to this plaza, there's going to be a QR, QR code at some point. You could take your smartphone, read that QR code, and get the story of all those people. So it was, this is, I think, one of our more immediate uh, examples of how you can really take art and tell that story. Um, tell the story of the city in a, in a great way. Um, and it really worked, it, it worked in, 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 in conjunction with the veterans because their first, when, we, when they first came to us, really the concept was aspire with the names. And we really worked with them to kind of think more broadly, think bigger and how, how you can, um, again, tell that story. Oops. And just another piece of, of uh, public art that's more recent. This is the Red Fence Gallery that's run by Beverly Main Streets as, as, as the managing entity of uh, the Beverly Arts District. And this is kind of a rotating gallery. It's a five by four uh, wall right on Cabot Street by Atomic Cafe. Um, and they will put out a call for arts, artists. And so this, I think there's seven installations. Is that, is that right, Brenda, seven? Yeah, I think there's been seven different uh, installations here. And it's just a kind of small, fun way to activate the, the street uh, using art. And so there's been a focus on downtown ever since uh, I got there. And I think in longer, uh, it's, it's been important for the city from an economic development perspective to really focus and make downtown a vibrant, active space. Um, there was a lot of vacancy there five, five or six years ago. Um, and so we've been really putting a lot of effort there, working with, again, our partner, Beverly Main Street. So I'm not going to go through every every single one of these things, but there's a retail incentive program to help try to bring retail to our downtown to support the arts and culture, make it a, a destination. Um, there's programming that Beverly Main Streets does, the block party two, three times a year, the, 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 and Arts Fest. So really ways uh, to uh, highlight and bring people to our downtown. Uh, public investment, we also have a sign and facade program that we administer in partnership with uh, Beverly Main Streets. So I'm going to transfer now to the kind of the policy and, and regulatory piece um, that I think Karen was most interested in me talking about. Um, so this first, this first set was what we had called a working title artisanal zoning uh, amendment in 2016. Um, you don't really get to call zoning artisanal very often. And really what we, what we wanted to do was make or facilitate the kinds of creative enterprises um, and make it easy for them to come to the city of Beverly. So we created new zoning for uh, microbreweries, distilleries, um, really those small ones that have tasting rooms. Um, the first one here is Gentilly Brewing. Uh, Paul Gentilly went through a lot to get into that space and we wanted to make it easy um, because that's the kind of use that's going to that's gonna bring um, that kind of vibe to your downtown, the active and vibrant vibe. Um, this building is also important because it's also the first place where uh, we had someone go through the live work ordinance and create artist live work space. So on the third and fourth floor of this building are three units uh, for artist live work that were um, that came and followed the the, 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 the live work regulations that we put in place. So this a lot of go there's also. There's also a, a record, label, record label in this building as well, so there's a lot going on there. But it's just a great example of how that the zoning facilitated and was able to bring that, these kind of um, maker and, and creative business to the city. We're still waiting for a maker space, so if you're looking to locate a maker space, look at Beverly, please. Um, and then on the regulatory piece, we hear a lot, and we heard a lot in the planning around the cultural district and the cultural district update about affordable housing. So we've been successful lately, um, but that its success has really raised the cost of living in the city of Beverly. And the last thing we want to do is, is push out residents, any resident, but also the creative residents who are making the art in the city. So we've put a real focus on affordable housing through inclu inclusionary housing ordinance in our zoning. 
um, and, and funding it. So working with local nonprofits to fund affordable housing and hopefully uh, some, at some point we'll be able to identify an artist live work affordable project. Um, so affordable housing is important to us. Um, and I also want to talk about active ground floors briefly. It's another zoning change where uh, we're trying to focus these areas in Cabot Street, focus them as the areas where we require active ground floor, ground floor uses, but we make it a buy right process, uh, meaning you don't have to go through a special permit process as long as you meet certain design standards. And what's important there is that we wanted to make the process easy for businesses who, and developers who wanted to bring that kind of use into our downtown with high standards of construction and design. And these are just examples of both buildings that have inclusionary affordable housing units and great retail spaces, well-designed retail spaces on the ground floor. And uh, I think we're almost done. Um, uh, historic preservation is also important to us. This is the GAR Hall in downtown Beverly. Uh, it's tired. It looks really tired, doesn't it? Um, uh, but we have been working hard to fund, uh, re rehabilitate that building. We've got about $400,000 through the Community Preservation Act to do that. Um, uh, the, the side and rear facade, front and side facades first. Um, the next step will be the interior and basement space that will be likely used as a community arts space, a more kind of open, um, you know, smaller kind of, I don't want to say black box, but um, a, a smaller venue for, you know, poetry readings and that sort of thing once municipal inspections moves out. And then public parking, you know, I said that as a question mark. Yes, it's important only because if people come downtown and they can't get a parking space, they're not going to stay downtown. So, but, you know, making uh, downtown accessible is important and something as mundane as managing your public parking um, is important to all of that. So, that's it. That's uh, all right. Come on. Thank you, Aaron. And then last but definitely not least is Al Wilson from Beyond Walls. So I'll, uh, I'll try and do a speed round real quick. Here. <laughs> so, um, so my name is Al Wilson. I'm the founder and executive director of Beyond Walls. Uh, we're a nonprofit placemaking agency headquartered in Lynn, Massachusetts with the mission to activate space to strengthen communities. Um, my background is not in this space, so I'd, my last two jobs were uh, in the private sector, largely opening offices on uh, the East Coast and Midwest of the US. Um, I ended up relocating and had a uh, place in, in Chelsea in New York and had seen what the High Line had done for that. My mom had been in Chelsea. Um, I opened an office in uh, Miami and discovered and become enthralled with Wynwood, this former uh, industrial zoned warehouse district, which is now actually the, the cultural uh, mecca of uh, greater Miami, eight uh, city blocks of street art. Uh, and also, I think we mentioned him earlier, Mark Daly. So I started thinking about placemaking and wanted to get off of the career track that I was on thought I'd give back for a year and start something. And I knew Lynn from um, growing up. I played soccer at uh, university, but played a, a number of players that had come out of Lynn, um, powerhouse players that beat us up when we played Salem State. But, um, and I went to a lecture by Mark Daly at, uh, at, it was either the BAC or BCA, one of, one of them. Um, and uh, Mark talked about King's Cross. My mom and dad are from the UK. My, um, all, all my cousins live in London. King's Cross is an area that I've known growing up, uh, really known for vice and crime, uh, prostitution and drugs. Great place in the 80s and 90s to see punk rock, if you were interested. But um, it's really been, uh, it's been transformed by placemaking. Uh, and so there's, there's an awful lot of good that's come out of these initiatives. Uh, there's some negatives that have come out too. Uh, and so, but, but looking at all of these made me think, uh, wanted to start something in Lynn and had some advantages. So we have a lead team of federal, state, local task force uh, that's focused on, um, on, on the economic development and prosperity for Lynn. 
Uh, it's led by Secretary Ash and Congressman Moulton. Um, and I was able to piggyback off of uh, something Mass Development was doing, which was a complete streets project. So they'd hired a um, Philadelphia consultant um, called Interface Studios to do this remapping of the streets. But really what it was was uh, community meetings, a series of community meetings where we gathered uh, feedback. Um, and so that feedback sort of really centered on wanting to create a, a larger economic output for Lynn, for the mom and pop businesses there. So this is really well attended by residents and uh, business owners who had a focus on increasing the walkability through better lighting and through more public art. So that centered me on trying to deliver this and we built a sizable committee, 28 uh, member committee, uh, mostly again made up from Lynn residents, mostly downtown residents and business owners. And we focus on these four initiatives. So large scale street art um, through a, a mural festival featuring international, regional and local artists that matched up to the cultural identities of downtown Lynn. Uh, an underpass lighting project, so 600 linear feet of underpass, uh, three MBTA uh, bridges that were either underlit or not lit at all. Um, we again worked with Mass Development who helped us heat map uh, property crime under uh, one of the bridges. And then on Market Street, it was the uh, fifth, fourth highest uh, vehicle on pedestrian strike zone in the state. So just a lot from, from a lack of lighting. Um, and then, you know, doing this work, you get to meet really interesting characters. Um, we met a great guy. He's uh, one, of the, one of the sort of foremost um, collectors of vintage neon. And I'm calling them vintage neon pieces of artwork because there's a downtown sign ordinance in Lynn that would prevent the hanging of neon signs. Um, <laughs> And uh, we took that tactic and never thought it would fly. I mean, really, it was, uh, it was, it was an outlier. Um, but lo and behold, we got the city decreed that these were pieces of art and not signs, and therefore we were able to hang in them. So we've hung 11 of them. Um, and then this was something that was fun, trying to get donated underpass lighting for uh, these three bridges. Um, GE, uh, many of you know GE has a, it still has a sizable plant, still the largest employer in Lynn, 3,000 people. Uh, in its heyday, when Lynn was well over 100,000 residents in the post-World War II boom, uh, it was over 45,000 parties were working there. And they actually manufactured the first jet engine produced by a U.S. manufacturer. It was made there in Lynn in 1942. So I've learned from this exercise, you got to ask, right? So we're trying to get into GE lighting. We're going through GE aviation. Can't think of anything else to ask. We asked for a jet engine. Um, <laughs> and they didn't know I was, we were winging it, right? So uh, we started this project in 2016 as far as asking for things. Um, and uh, December 29th of 2016, they gave me a complete engine. So, um, so it's fun. So, and we, and we started to build a team. So, uh, you know, Lynn's, uh, like many, and we've been talking about gateway cities uh, of the Commonwealth, these former industrial cities of the Commonwealth. Um, fantastic people, culturally diverse, um, really cool infrastructure, built environment, um, dense urban core, uh, challenges, whether mismanagement or uh, jobs that have left the city, often with an economic crisis, so Lynn fits into that narrative. Um, we don't have a city planner, and we don't have a city planning department, so just being candid with the group, right? Um, for comparison, our, our neighboring city just next door, Salem, um, has 14 city planners. So, um, so in lieu of a city planner, we needed a city planner. Pedro Soto, who is working as a senior city planner in Peabody, who is donating 30 hours a week in addition to his 40 hour day job. He was donating time with Beyond Walls. He joins us. He has the foresight to reach out. You know, we don't know what we're doing with the engine. He reaches out to uh, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Um, they don't believe he has the engine, so we send them <laughs> photos of us with the engine. Uh, and, and the phone, which never rings. The phone never rings in the office. Phone rings. You know, it's this head conservator who wants to know how we have this engine. So, 
Long story short, we get over that hump. He ends up liking us and he sends us a, a plan and we use uh, the Lynn, uh, we, we hire a Harvard conservator to come up to, to Lynn and he works with the students from Lynn Vocational Technical Institute, the local vocational high school. Uh, we pay for all the tools and they've cleaned this engine twice over. Um, we've conserved it and it's gonna be uh, put into City Hall likely late winter, early spring, so. So, so I mentioned this sort of really cool built environment. So here we are in Lynn, you can see some of the artwork from our 2017 installation. Um, you know, we learned an awful lot here. I, I'll tell you, I'll just go back, you know, because, uh, because the, the talk is on, on also mentioning challenges of placemaking and I've learned an awful lot. And this is one of those cases where, you know, I wish I had the DeLorean time machine to go back and make sure that all parties knew that this, these community meetings were, you know, the feedback from that increased walkability, better lighting, more public art. You can see how many people were there. Um, I thought everyone knew this is why we're doing this, right? But what I've learned really is you've got to, you've, one, don't do that, right? Don't, don't assume anything. Uh, and two, you better really make sure that you're not only reaching out, you're continuing to reach out and you're not reaching out in government locations, right? So holding something at City Hall isn't a fit, uh, especially with the, the current national dialogue parties that are, you're in a culturally diverse area. Some parties might be afraid to go to City Hall. So you learn from these projects, right? But, um, but I, I obviously, I, my heart's pretty close to this thing. I think we, you know, we, had, we had the best intentions and we, we set out and we did what we intended to do. So um, first year was 20 artists putting up 15 large scale pieces of street art. Again, the cultural identities of these artists matched those in Lynn. Um, the, now we've installed 11 pieces of, the, of this vintage neon. So the intention is to have yeah, vintage neon art, right? This, uh, this, uh, some of these make sense. So, you know, you can think of like industries that have left us, right? This is a typewriter exchange, you know? <laughs> I don't see that coming back. Um, but uh, none of them are on buildings that house anything like this, right? So it's just this random weirdness, which is particularly appealing to me. But um, this, this fish and poultry sign, the, the guy that's in that building, he's, his name's Frank. He's this biker from New Hampshire. He's, he actually, came with the building. The building got purchased in 2003. Frank stayed, right? He's, he's ticked off at me. People keep going in there looking for fish and poultry. So, um, so anyways, but, but, the, but the intention is look, light, light the streets, right? Get more people walking around downtown. Um, with more people comes a better sense of safety, better sense of safety, more mom and pop shops are just doing additional commerce. You know, something that we did after our first mural festival, we hired a third party consultant web management out of New York City. Um, they uh, showed a sizable uh, incremental um, spending at a, a local coffee shop, $110,000 during our mural festival. That coffee shop actually feeds into a nonprofit, uh, the Haven Project, so they, they have a sort of uh, you know, on their books, they have a pre Beyond Walls and a post Beyond Walls. Um, we uh, we increase their average days uh, ring by something like 112 rings. So it's significant. Um, so the creative economy, we're all here because of that. It's real. Um, we had over 5,000 parties uh, attend our mural festival from outside of Lynn. We had parties that hadn't visited downtown in decades in some cases. Um, from Lynn come to Lynn. That was something that amazed me. Um, we ended up with over 75 pieces of earned media, including we got Chronicle to come and feature us in Lynn. Um, this is the underpass lighting project. So again, three bridges. Um, we, uh, we knew that we needed a, a partner on this and, and you know, I'm not mentioning some of the union support that we had. The DC 35, the painters union, uh, really got behind us, helped prime uh, and paint many of our walls prior to the artist's arrival and then train, you know, something that was really important to us was artist safety. So they actually trained the artists in lift operation, even if these artists had been doing it for 20 years, they hadn't had the OSHA standard training. So they all got certified. That was then something that they could take with them. It's internationally recognized. We paid all our artists in our first year, something that was critically important. 
was paying the artists. We flew them in. We paid for all of their paint. We housed them. We did a ton of uh, community dinners and just an awful lot of events. Meet the artist panel. Um, I'll speak to some of the ones we did this last year. But this is a lighting ceremony. So really, this was a dedication. This is us just turning on the lights. Uh, we had over 500 people turn out. Again, using uh, Lintech, these were three students that wanted to go in to uh, be electricians and they got to work with all our electrical crew. Um, this was a heavy, heavy lift. So this was three teams of four guys each, uh, 10 and a half weeks through the winter to get this turned on. So big in-kind support. I, I love this because you, know, you, know, you see so many times where this was our, this was our initial concept drawing from uh, uh, again, in-kind support by Payette, an architect firm that we'd reached out to, who just loved Lynn. You know, they took to it and it was like buildings of scale with a raised rail. It's like Disney World for architects, so they did it. But if you look at the final product, it's, uh, it's pretty tight, yeah. So we've just put in a central brain. It allows for you to interact with this, so you'd be able to tweet at it and change the color. Um, we haven't announced that in Lynn yet, but that's coming up. So, um, and so it was a hit. So it brought us to 2018 Mural Festival, and um, you know, so this was 31 new murals from 24 artists. Again, you know, artists. When we think of this community, uh, really heavy uh, Cambodian uh, population there, third largest uh, in in the states. Um, heavy Dominican, heavy Puerto Rican, heavy uh, Eastern European. So artists again that would match up to that. Um, sometimes we bring in like Cambodian artists who happen to be in Montreal, heck of a lot cheaper for us to bring in Brian. So, um, but something that we learned, again, that DeLorean time machine, right? Our first year, our filter was, man, can they pull off this wall? What's their, what's their work history look like? Do they match up to the cultural identities? We didn't apply that filter that said, well, wait a second, do we have an even female male split? Uh, the genre skews like 95% male. Um, you got to be completely nuts to be on a lift. But uh, so, um, so we, anyways, we managed to bring in uh, this 50-50 split. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a big accomplishment. It was good. So expanded, so again, lesson learned, right? Because you really hear from it in this space. You know, you don't realize how public you are. Um, and we are just three, you know, we're now three parties working at this full time and I'm chasing funding often. So um, please don't mind me if I'm looking at your shoes as I go around the room later. But um, <laughs> but it is, it's, it's, a, it's a passion uh, project, but, um, but you take the hits when you make mistakes. And obviously that was a big mistake we made our first year out. Um, Something that we really wanted to do this year was just celebrate everything else that's going on in Lynn. So we, we made a real attempt to do uh, uh, an outreach to the community and an outreach into parts of the community um, that I would perhaps have an obstacle going out and reaching out to. So um, we brought on a, an additional party to help us do that and there were 50 community events. So the idea was, could we get three things happening every day in Lynn? Um, so that if someone came here for a early afternoon event, they stay, they get another event, then they go to dinner and they see something else. And again, that creative economy and, and, and also sort of certainly shining a spotlight on really what is an unbelievable community uh, there in Lynn. Um, so success, maybe bit off more than we could chew with, with going for 50, but um, you learn. Uh, and so then that brings us to the future. Uh, you know, we do have a, uh, we do have a project, um, and I want to mention it because it's in Beverly, it's with the Cabot Theater. Um, so this year Beyond Walls will be, um, has been working with them to uh, do community outreach, um, and ultimately we'll be putting up two pieces of art on, uh, on the Cabot. So. Um, it's kind of really, a, it's a landmark theater and we're really, really proud to be involved with that. And again, that funding came through the ECCF. Um, we've also got our own project uh, through, through that fund, through the Creative County Fund, um, which is parklets. So we'll be engaging spaces in the city. But this is the big, the big beast. So this is la the launch. Um, what you have in Lynn, right, so state bailed out Lynn um, for 2018 and 2019 to the tune of $14 million, right? Um, 
and drop the phone. <laughs> but uh, but that's it, right? So so no more. You know, we're not reaching into the wallet anymore. State, of, you know, city of Lynn, you got to get it on your own. Uh, Five point six million dollar projected um, budget deficit for 2020. This is without a city planning department. So you think of the challenges of operating a city: plow trucks, not enough police, not enough fire. Um, trash removal. So there's 305 acres of waterfront inland that has largely been in, uh, for industrial and maritime use. Um, and by maritime use, I really mean industry, that it was advantageous for it to sit on the waterfront. Um, we also have a, a Walmart on the waterfront. You know, uh, It's crazy. It's 10 miles outside of Boston. You know, So it means that everybody has high hopes for this waterfront and the lead team is working to get some of this rezoned. Um, the challenge we think is that without a planning department, no city planner, this is, and with ownership owning variety of parcels here, um, and some of those owners not getting along with each other, what happens is you're gonna, you're gonna end up developing little pockets of the waterfront. And without a master plan, um, it's really easy for the public to no longer have access to the water. I think if you're looking at the city's finances, you look at the city of Boston and the waterfront they did there, and it looks as a shining example of what you could, could do. But for any of us that have walked through that, and it's really not walkable, but all of the public space feels very private. And so here in Lynn, you've got 1A, which would be this natural um, segregator of what would be new parties coming, you know, North Harbor site is the first to be developed here, plans to break ground in the spring, um, with a much higher median family income than you would have here in, in Lynn. Um, so the idea for this park, this three acre site that we've managed to somehow convince the mayor and the city to give to us on a lease. So we have a three year lease with two one year options for this space. It abuts a $7.8 million ferry terminal that was built. Um, it wasn't marketed well. Um, this was federal and state dollars that went into it, ran for two years, and it's no longer running. But water transportation is going to be critical for, for, um, for this part of the state, and it's something that we certainly want to get running again and put it back on the map. So um, we want to really promote this space and that this exists. So again, you know, for us, the belief is that all parties should have access to street art. Um, this, the Chapter 91 agreement for many of these developments is to build a boardwalk. So you'll see a board, this is Kettle Cuisine. They build uh, all the, they make all the soups for Whole Foods and such. Um, they've just built two 90 foot stacks so that Lynn doesn't on certain days smell like French onion soup, which I'm a fan of, but apparently it wasn't cool. Um, so their Chapter 91 has them actually bringing a boardwalk to this uh, site. Uh, and the ultimate goal is that a boardwalk would stretch all the way down to the South Harbor. Um, we're trying to pay, we'll, we're trying to raise the money to pay to make this area the best possible boardwalk. So that 16 foot wide boardwalk that would allow for a ton of amenities. You know, you think about it, if we build the first building block and put that block in place, we then sort of set the standard and then for everybody else to build on that. Um, but this is the natural, you know, if that, when that takes place, and this is a highly walkable site, plus we have all this parking, this is actually where parties will be mixing it up. Um, and so we think it's a very important project and, and the one that we're centered on now. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Al and Aaron and Aaron, uh, all of you. I encourage you all to continue to think about our culture broadly and our culture in terms of the communities that we all live in and how we live there and what we value in those communities, including all of our heritage and industries. So thank you, panel members, for coming. And uh, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Karen Rissabin, very much for leading this seminar tonight. Have a good evening, all. Thank you.